Titan, the only world in the solar system aside from our own where we know there's liquid of some kind on the surface of the planet, or rather the moon I suppose is the better term to use, and this came as a surprise to very few people when we started to explore this moon in great detail, simply because the conditions were just right beneath Titan's atmosphere to create liquid, although of course not liquid water, but something else entirely. With a surface temperature of almost minus 180 degrees Celsius, the surface of this world is unbelievably cold, far colder than Mars at least most of the time. So what sort of liquid could possibly form here? Well, we're talking about liquid methane and liquid ethane. In other words, liquid natural gas that's formed rivers and lakes on the surface of this world. and surface conditions and an environment unlike anything else that we've ever imagined or ever encountered. And yet, everything that we've learned about this moon, mostly through the Cassini probe and also through the Huygens probe that actually managed to land on the surface of the moon, well, it's created as many questions as it has answers. But although Titan certainly bears exploring, there have been a large number of very vocal people, at least who are into the idea of colonizing the solar system, who feel that this moon is far more appropriate for colonization than Mars. But that begs a lot of questions. I mean, it's colder than Mars. The atmosphere, although certainly there and certainly dense, is extremely poisonous. There's nothing about this moon that bears any similarity to Earth, and the gravity is even lighter than that of Mars, which would mean people who settle there would experience even greater degradation of their muscle mass and bone mass. So why the hell would we want to settle here? Well, it's my belief that future colonists from Mars, not from Earth, are going to ultimately settle here for reasons that we're going to explore later in this video, but we're not going to explore it through me. We are instead going to explore it through the eyes of a Martian colonist that I've invented, and his name is Andrew Mackay. So smash that like, hit that subscribe, and if you're interested in the sunglasses that I talked about in my previous video, the first ever Angry Astronaut sunglasses, well, the pre-orders are coming in, so check the description, and I hope you enjoy the trip. My name is Captain Andrew Mackay, and the date is Sol 281, 36 AC, or for those of you who still use the old calendar, January 21st, 2117, as if the old calendar really matters anymore. We're closing in on our destination after almost a half a year has passed since our departure from Mars once again. Half a Martian year for those of you who cling to the old way of doing things. And yeah, you guys are out there, even though I don't really understand why you do it. But 
That having been said, this isn't an official log, so if you don't like it, just switch it the hell off. But I'm making this for posterity's sake, whatever that might mean, in the event that our colony on Titan doesn't survive, and to give people an idea of why the hell we're doing this after everything we've accomplished on Mars, after all of the large habitable structures, biodomes, and everything else that we've managed to build there why are we leaving Mars so quickly? Well, it's probably because of people like me. People who want to get the hell away from Mars for whatever reason. At first, colonizing Mars was as tough as everybody said that it was going to be. No air, no air pressure for that matter, so a ruptured visor or some sort of significant suit breach would lead to a very painful, agonizing death. And that was just one of a million ways to die on Mars. Radiation bombarding the surface all the time, everybody checking their rad count every time they came in, and all always calculating what their accumulated sieverts were, because the higher the number of sieverts you absorbed over the years, the greater your chance of developing cancer at some point. Although some people beat the odds and absorbed as much as two, sometimes three sieverts, and still never died of cancer, but died of natural causes. We humans are difficult things to figure out, but all of our habitation structures were built with this in mind. Keep out the radiation and watch out for that huge pressure difference because both of these things are going to kill you. And yet, neither of these things are going to be problems on Titan, which is one of the reasons that justified us making this massive journey almost a billion miles all the way out to Saturn. But really, that's not the reason. Not really. In the 24,906 souls that have passed since our first colony was established, we have had only one explosive decompression that resulted in the deaths of eight colonists. Just one. So really, our habitats performed just as expected, comprised of basaltic fiber and very little in the way of materials that we brought from Earth, the vast majority of things being manufactured on Mars, which was the whole damn idea, wasn't it? Self-sustaining colony, you gotta have that if you're gonna be a multi-planetary civilization, and we did it, and did it well. And it turned out that Mars had a little surprise waiting for us that made the process even easier. A hell of a lot of astrobiologists had a hell of a lot of red faces when the first expedition from SpaceX landed on the Martian surface way back in 2031. Again, if you're using the old calendar, because we did use the old calendar back then, Life was discovered from the moment we dug the first handful of regolith out of the Martian surface and put it inside an electron microscope. It was there, it was abundant, and it was so damn obvious. And it should have been. We detected life on Mars way back in 1976 with the first mission that had the only life detection equipment for almost half a century afterwards. Almost no attempt was made to find life after life was detected by the Viking probe way back then. So it should have been obvious to everybody, but it wasn't. It's hard to believe that we once thought that other worlds that had favorable conditions for life to evolve, for life to survive, wouldn't therefore have that kind of life. That our planet was somehow chosen, somehow special, somehow selected by God to have life, and nowhere else was going to be so blessed, at least not in our own solar system. And we needed so much 
proof, but that proof was very quick in coming, and it turned out that that bacteria proved to be incredibly useful to us because it consumed perchlorates and produced oxygen as a byproduct. We had already brought along enzymes from bacteria on Earth that did the same thing, and it turned out that we didn't even need it. All we needed to do was culture the bacteria in an environment that was more friendly to it, that is to say, warmer and not bombarded by radiation all the time, and it flourished. And not only did it flourish, it started producing oxygen in massive quantities while cleaning the regolith for us at the same time. And with clean regolith, we didn't have to use aeroponics or aquaponics anymore. We could just start planting bushes, trees, and God knows what else in the regolith, and they grew just like they grew in lunar regolith. It was amazing, and also it proved to be such an obvious thing that once life is introduced to an environment where it can survive, it's going to take hold and it's going to flourish because that's what life does. And not just on Mars, also on Europa, also Enceladus, it's all over the damn solar system. And oh yeah, another thing that the early colonists discovered is that they could grow cannabis on Mars. It grew really well there, and it proved to be a very lucrative export back to Earth. And hell, our founder was Elon Musk. He sure didn't care. Everything was looking so promising on Mars. We moved from small modular habitats into much, much larger ones, utilizing certain silicate compounds to construct the domes, which provided a little bit of protection from the radiation, but also enhanced the warmth of the sun. At certain times of day, you didn't even need life support in order to have the necessary warmth to support human life or the plants for that matter. Matter. You only really needed life support at nighttime or perhaps at certain times during the winter, and the equatorial colonies did a lot better than the ones closer to the poles, which is why we have so much more of the Martian population at the equator. Plus, you also had underground habitats for people who preferred that and didn't want to be absorbing any radiation at all. And I suppose they're doing a little bit better because they're not developing cancer at as high of a rate as those who like to explore the Martian surface, but God, if they wanted to live in caves, why didn't they stay back on Earth? Oh yeah, and another thing, why the hell did we try to make helicopters on Mars to fight against the ridiculously thin atmosphere with blades spinning unbelievably fast just to get a few ounces off the surface when we could just use airships to accomplish the same thing. It turns out that the same hydrogen that allowed the Hindenburg to fly would also allow us to carry huge cargoes across the Martian surface without any risk of an explosion, simply because there's no oxygen in the Martian atmosphere, or certainly not enough to cause hydrogen to burn. So this was a much more obvious solution and one that we embraced quickly as well. And and our colonies spread, and so did our population. Everything was looking very positive. The only real drawback was plastic. And the more probes we sent to Titan, the more it became obvious that everything we needed in order to make plastic was here on this distant moon of Saturn. And although there are many ways to substitute for plastic, and there are ways to manufacture it on Mars, as long as you have carbon, and some other elements. You can make plastic out of just about anything, but it's so energy intensive. It is so difficult. And as time passed, we found out just how much our civilization had been using plastic from speakers and smartphones to computers, cameras, television, textiles, acrylics, rayons, polyester, nylon, spandex, shoes, purses, golf balls, football helmets, surfboards, skis, tennis rackets, beauty products, eyeshadow, mascara, hand lotion, toothpaste, soap, shaving cream. My God, this shit was 
everywhere, and it was really difficult to divorce ourselves from dependence on it. So we tried to make it on Mars, and it just wasn't all that easy, so we had to import it from Earth. At least, that was the easier way to do it. That is, until the crazy bastards back on Earth decided that they didn't want to be a multiplanetary civilization anymore. We don't know what caused it, or at least we don't like to talk about it. If we did, then we would start placing blame and connecting ourselves to the nation-states that we used to belong to, which would just create more disagreement, more resentment, and more hate. All we know is things started out with a few nuclear explosions, one perhaps set off by terrorists, and then responses set off by the terrorist target, and then that led to escalation and ultimately a full exchange. A full exchange that was followed by an entire decade of winter and utter silence. We haven't received a single signal from our home planet since that fateful day, and for good reason. All of the electromagnetic pulses that blanketed the planet probably knocked out all of the electronics in every transmitter that could possibly reach us. And when we finally did send a couple of probes to the surface of our home world, all we found was utter devastation. The vast majority of the devastation wasn't caused by the bombs, but rather by an entire decade of darkness which killed off almost all the plant life, a mass extinction event the like of which our planet hasn't seen since the great die-off back 60 million years ago with the end of the dinosaurs. We really don't know what is still alive back on Earth. We haven't seen much of anything aside from evidence of certain types of bacteria and a few different types of insects. And what the hell did we expect after all, right? I mean, we blocked out the sun for 10 damn years. It killed almost every type of plant. Even insects would struggle to survive under those sorts of circumstances, let alone larger mammals. Yeah, there may be some humans surviving in each out a terrible existence in some underground dwelling, but if so, we don't know about it. And we've started to stop looking and stop thinking about it, especially me, given that one of the people that I left behind was my daughter. She was supposed to join me. She was supposed to come after me. Year after year, there was one delay after another, one project after another that absolutely had to be fixed, had to be rectified before she could come to Mars. And then it was too late. So after that, the planet that I so desperately wanted to immigrate to, a planet that seemed so beautiful and so magnificent at first, became a red hell. So when the opportunity came up to explore another world that would have the raw materials necessary to make plastic, which would be convenient to our civilization, not absolutely necessary, but still an important part of our economy, well, I was the first to sign up. Not because I give a damn about plastic, not because I give a damn about Titan's whole hydrologic cycle or whatever the hell you want to call it when you have methane and ethane involved but simply because it was as far away from Earth as I could get. And Titan was a convenient escape valve for economic reasons amongst many others. There's the natural hydrocarbons on Titan that, although not the same as the petroleum we used to use back on Earth to make plastic, will still serve perfectly for these purposes. We're going to be able to manufacture things on Titan that we haven't been able to manufacture for quite some time, and not only that, we're going to be able to sail on Titan. Yeah, it's not going to be the same as sailing on an ocean, but still, submarines on Titan, just for the first time in years. As a matter of fact, for the first time in some of these kids' lives, the ones who were actually born on Mars, they will be able to sail on the surface of a body of liquid or delve beneath it to see what lies under the surface. And it's going to be pretty damned interesting from what we've been able to ascertain thus far. There's evidence of methanogenic life on Titan. We have no idea 
have what it's going to look like, whether it's just going to be like bacteria as we have here on Mars, or if it might be something a little bit more complicated. Lots of new mysteries for these kids to explore, and they can't wait. And that's just one of a variety of things that Titan has to offer that Mars does not. The whole pressure issue doesn't exist on Titan either. If you were to have a cracked faceplate or a suit breach or even a breach in your airlock, yeah, the atmosphere is poisonous, but it wouldn't cause an explosive decompression. You would have plenty of time to patch the problem before your suit or your habitat became poisonous. It's not nearly as big of a crisis if you have some sort of breach on Titan. Not only that, you don't need a legitimate environment suit on Titan. Just a very good thermal suit to protect you from the cold and an oxygen supply. You need significantly less than you need on Mars in order to survive because there just isn't the same kind of pressure issue. The things that make Mars so incredibly lethal simply do not exist on Titan. Yes, it's a very cold place, a very hostile place, but it just doesn't have the same kind of instant death scenarios that Mars does, or the slow death scenarios because Titan's atmosphere provides complete protection from solar radiation and cosmic rays. You're not going to have to take rad counts every time you go out on an EVA. You're not going to have to keep track of your sievert levels or worry about developing some sort of cancer later in your life because you made a decision to live on another world. As a matter of fact, people who live on Titan are probably going to live substantially longer than Martian colonists are. And when it comes down to it, we Martians were the best choice for people to go to Titan in the first place. The Delta V necessary to go from Mars to Titan is so much less than what's required to go from Earth to Titan. Assuming that Earth civilization had survived at all, we Martians would have been the first ones to go to Titan. Firstly, because it's easier, and secondly, because the transition from Mars to Titan is not nearly as much of a piece of culture shock as making the transition from Earth to Titan. As a matter of fact, for many young Martians, it's going to be a better place. It rains on Titan, there are swamps on Titan, and mud and dunes of solid hydrocarbons. It has a nitrogen atmosphere 50% thicker than Earth, so we'll never have to worry about pressure issues there. And Saturn's magnetosphere also provides additional protection from radiation. Cosmic rays, radiation will never be a problem on Titan. We're never going to have to design our habitats out of thick, basaltic fiber to protect us from pressure differential and also from radiation. It's going to be a whole lot simpler and Titan is going to provide abundant resources to manufacture plastic habitats, plastic electronics, plastic everything. Plastic which was such a negative thing on Earth, which was such a pollutant on Earth is just a naturally occurring thing on Titan. Something that isn't going to be problematic for its future and something that will fuel our civilization there. Plus, we can use the hydrocarbons as fuel. And also, since there's no oxygen in Titan's atmosphere, we don't have to worry about these hydrocarbons bursting into flame or exploding in the event of some kind of accident. Given the lack of pressure differential and because of the low gravity, we'll be able to construct enormous plastic domes which will be inflated by warm oxygen and nitrogen. Since Titan has a nitrogen atmosphere, we're going to have an honest-to-God oxygen-nitrogen atmosphere inside our domes. This will allow for huge indoor spaces. We Titanians also are not going to have to spend nearly as much inside as Mars. Martians do. The recreational opportunities on Titan are going to be different than anywhere else in the solar system. For example, 
we're going to be able to fly. The weak gravity combined with a thick atmosphere will allow people to use modified wings on their backs. And if the wings fall off and you plunge to your death, well, you won't really be plunging to your death because terminal velocity on Titan is one-tenth of that on Earth. So you could fall off a cliff and probably survive the experience. And also, like many of the Jovian moons, there is an abundance of water on Titan, or rather, inside Titan. A vast liquid ocean of water combined with some other elements, probably, that we're going to have to drill and harvest. As a matter of fact, the robots that we sent ahead of us to manufacture the initial habitats have already done this. And who knows what we're going to find in that subsurface ocean. Already, we have evidence that there are ice canos on Titan, not nearly as violent as there are in other places in the solar system, but enough to bring water to the surface, along with the oxygen that we're going to need for our artificial environments, and of course the water necessary to grow our crops. Everything that we learned on Mars is going to be even easier to carry out on Titan. The only potential drawback is the fact that there's no real regolith that you can grow plants in on Titan, so we're going to probably have to stick with aeroponics and aquaponics. But who knows? Who knows what this moon might have waiting for us? And there may even be two different distinctive types of life on Titan. Methanogenic life, as I mentioned before, and also more conventional life beneath the surface. And both have the potential of being multicellular. We might find life in an immense abundance abundance on this moon. Two unique and distinctive ecosystems. I have to admit, the kids on this mission, they can't wait to get there and get busy. I wish I could share their enthusiasm, but I have to admit, looking at Saturn as we slowly approach this moon, and yeah, it does look slow, even though we're using plasma engines at this point, traveling many times faster than mankind used to just decades ago. It's still going to be a little while, but in the meantime, I have to admit, this planet is amongst the most beautiful things that I have ever seen. It almost makes me forget everything else. And even though I have my doubts that I'm ever going to be truly happy again, if there's a way that I can make this colony succeed, and these kids who were born on Mars and felt cheated that they never had the opportunity to see an ocean, to swim in an ocean, or to sail on an ocean, or fly through the air, they were cheated of all of these opportunities because they weren't born on Earth. And then, of course, Earth cheated them of any opportunity to ever see these things, even in pictures. If I can just give them an opportunity to experience something new, exciting, and something that they can call their own, well, that's a lot more purpose than most people get in their lifetime. In the meantime, astrophysics and life sciences are fighting one another for lab time again, so I guess I need to go and try to rectify that. And in the meantime, this is Captain Andrew Mackay, signing off. <laughs>